Hi, everyone. So I first need to emphasize what an honor it is to be introducing my former mentor at Cornell, Lyra. And she's just, she's just so wonderful. I still remember my first class with her, her passion, her hands-on approach to poetry, and of course, her poetic advice and metaphors. Lyra's poems resonate a unique form of art that, using her words, and I truly believe, F with the ineffable. Again, her lesson being that poetry, or good poetry, should F with the ineffable. And I really believe that as writers, we all want to achieve this. We all want to achieve this kind of indescribable, ineffable, sublime. And so let's take, for instance, these lines from her poem, Reclining Newt, circa 1977, Romare Bearden. You want to say she is peach ripe, fragrant, dark fruit sweetening around a hard grooved seed, the tan parchment beneath her Florida sand, as all things bring you back there to land. His simplest collage, a woman. And that's really desire personified. Lyrae's poetry is truly a sublime mix of mythology, astronomy, of the body and its sensuality, mixed in with writing towards a science and also writing towards an art. She is there creating a sense of mystery that not only baffles the reader, but also baffles her. And as a result, this kind of harmony, this working together of both the poet and and with the reader is truly beautiful. And Lyrae is not only an amazing poet, but also an amazing teacher. She is currently an associate professor of English and creative writing at Cornell University. She is the author of Open Interval, which was a 2009 National Book Award finalist, along with Black Swan, winner of the 2001 Kavi Kanam Poetry Prize. And she has recently contributed to the Migration Series at the Museum of Modern Art. So please join me in welcoming Lyrae Van Cleef Stefanen. Thank you all so much for having me. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here, and a particular pleasure given that it's freezing cold in Ithaca right now, and a particular pleasure given that my friend Cynthia and, and my heart, Dorothy, is here. Um, so this is a, a, a lot of fun for me to be able to be here. Um, Everybody, can, he, can you hear me okay? I like to start out with um, reading. Sometimes uh, um, friends or people who write poems who I know and everything uh, start off with poems that you wish you had written. And so I like to kind of sprinkle my reading sometimes with poems um, that I wish I had written. And so I actually want to start in, with a poem by Cynthia Hogue that I think is really, really fantastic. And I'd like also to think about, like uh, I was talking about in the, in the craft talk today, being present where you are and like kind of writing from home, but also like kind of writing from what is, what is the space you in, you're in and what are the conversations that are happening in that, in that space. And I like to be in conversation and for my poems to be in conversation, not just kind of out there on their own. So this is In the Meadow Magenta, reading Robert Duncan and Halden Forrest by Cynthia Hogg. Bloom looks like Lupin from afar, but up close, the small bell-like flowers of wild hollyhock, the holy that forth came that must come mystery of frond fern, gorse, a magic to which I relate to land of hillock and boulder, the grayer sky and wood, the straight flat one between them barred by the bushy Scots pine, medicinal viridian of ever green, which though gossip, rumor, spell, or chance change us is not changed. I love that. It's particularly with my obsession right now with color. 
and so I'm going to roll from that into a poem called um, Carnelian, which is one of the uh, Cornell University's, uh, their colors, their official colors are Carnelian and white. And I'm, I'm going to be a little slower than usual this evening. I'm reading from this little machine. I hate technology. Let me not jinx it, though. This, I love you, little machine. <laughs> Keep working. <laughs> this is Carnelian. First, I think I am seeing apple skin, then tomato skin, not stone. It is too easy to say red, enjoyable to study the difference, discover sard, harder and tougher, but duller, Hackley, Carnelian's cousin. Dried blood, yes, the blood on the banjo, describable now, but how now describe its dirty, thrum-battered, goatskin head. It is impossible to say without, saying where am I, where have I been without getting lost. I am simply sitting in a room looking at an illustration, one version of a color, hence August, heirlooms plump heirlooms, gorgeous, plump, and ugly heft, how a sharp knife slides through mottled flesh, the weight of water, sex, the other sweetbreads, something heavy again, a bloody red, a blue-red veining through a heavy morsel. I'm reading poems so brand new, like kind of in this reading that I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's done. I don't know. You all can tell me after. Give me the. <laughs> Maybe. So I'm going to switch to Black Swan. I was talking earlier in the day about having been raised Pentecostal. In Black Swan, there are all of these women from um, the Bible and women from mythology who show up and have things to say about the things that happen to them. All of the women in the Bible who, well, I mean, not all of them, but, but a, a number of women from the Bible who are, are raped and a number of women um, from mythology who have been raped by Zeus, who's always taking some form or another and doing something terrible. Um, so this is Dinah. Um, from Genesis 34, 1, which reads, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Dinah. I grew up watching them cut their eyes, grit their teeth at each other. My aunt, entering a room, stiffened my mother. They warred years over that old man asleep in the back room, my father spent. Their weapons, sons, they pushed from their bodies. My mother bore six, prayed with each. Now he will not hate me. He will not wipe himself with the sheet, leave my bed without looking back. Tonight, when he comes, he will not picture my sister. I never played with girls. Only this army of brothers they mustered, feeding my father female bodies. Other women snatched into his bed, delivered like sacrifices. They consumed themselves, wasteful, greedy. When I went out into the city that day, I wanted to meet women who looked at each other, whose bodies kept their softness in the presence of their sisters. Instead, I met a man, relearned my family's definitions for love, body, 
weapon. And then this is Europa, who is the woman in the mythology who Zeus comes and carries off. This one, this one he takes, I think it's a white bull he shows up as when he attacks Europa. So this is Europa, Daytona Beach, Florida. She is still enough to taste standing on the beach, the town where she was born. She watches the sun, the first pip of orange yellow that peeks through flat blue, then spreads like song. Every morning, this miracle and others, the swoop of gulls diving into the wave laps for fish, or the salty dash that day the sea turtles hatched. Today, a bull as still as God and tame enough to touch. Who has not waited spellbound for a glimpse of God? Even now, the dawn's devout dot the flat packed sand parked for worship. Where am I? Parked for worship. Who has not listened for a whisper in sea spray and sunlight, prayed for a sight like this, one beast so wildly out of place, it might speak, it just might speak, and she would be the only witness. Before the first tide's crowd arrives, she walks toward the bull. Before the hot day's flood of tourists, she enters his presence. Who has not been betrayed with waiting, wanting one word sweet and sacred from the mouth of creation? What's left of her gown twisted around her left shoulder, whips in the wind that catches her hair, the smell of musk and heat, the shaft of bull's neck stretches up in a taut arc etched by rivulets of sweat, thick veins standing on its flanks, its great eye rolled back. With a tight grimace, it licks the sun. The muscles of her thighs tensed high above its haunches, she reaches wild-eyed for that tongue. I'm going to switch to Body Worlds <laughs> that I was talking about earlier on today. Body Worlds is the creepiest exhibit I've ever seen in my entire life. And I, I always, I, I tell this story, I tell this story too much, but um, about, uh, um, I hate the thing, just the idea of it. As soon as I heard about it, I thought, this is miserable and terrible and disgusting and no, 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 everything in me says no. But also that poet voice in me was just like, you have to go and look at that. <laughs> and I was like, why do we have to do it? And I told that story to my colleague and friend, Ken McLean, one time. And he said to me, I don't have that voice. <laughs> my voice doesn't tell me that I have to do things like that. And then I always like to tell how I was on the, on the um, bus one day, sitting in the, in the front of the bus, like right behind the bus driver. And the bus got in. Um, as we were driving down the street behind the roadkill truck. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the road, roadkill truck. In, but yes, yes, so it, it, who's ever been behind the roadkill truck. So the roadkill truck was out, and I guess it had been out for a while, and it was just piled high with just dead deer. Oh, and I, when I first noticed it get in front of us, and I was like, oh, no, look away. And then that terrible poet's voice is like, no, you look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. And I've never even written a poem about that roadkill truck. Why did I have to look at that? I just don't even know. Oh, gosh. 
so body worlds too in case i am preparing myself preparing to lose race i don't know what i will have to do without it this is the most unromantic way i know how to get into the between how to exceed divorce erasure corpses diligently labeled plastinates someone's skinned in laws an exhibition sold out in advance i haven't even seen it and i'm freaked i keep reeling kennedy's skull flap too pink shot back the reflexed hands to the throat i'm sitting in my element at the edge of cayuga lake it's spring why peel it back away look here at my beautiful foot my windshield's clean. I rest my leg against the heating vents. My long brown foot foregrounded on the dash before the sky's excellent blue clear April. My silver painted pedicure. Why move beyond these slender bark brown silver tipped toes? What's under my skin is ugly meat, sinew, who is asking and why ruin the view out the window? Willow branches, willows, branches, yellow going green, push left of their shadow black trunks by wind, loose and graceful like the arms of ballerinas. Then the breeze stiffens, the skinny strand, strands straighten, extend like stick them legs, arabesque, on point, look. No one wants the dead in toe shoes, but that's keeping it real, keeping even the empty body on display. The real threat of seeing, uh, the real threat of the exhibition, of seeing the one who's been posed, holding his own, split skin open, like a flasher by its flayed edges. And that was in there. <laughs> Just like that. It was terrible. <laughs> this is July 2005, London. I arrived in London um, the evening before the 7 7 attacks in 2005. I was supposed to be on a subway that morning to go to York to look at the papers of John Goodrick, who's this astronomer who I was writing about in here. If I had not had jet lag, I would probably be dead. Um, the, the attacks happened in a triangle around my flat. And so I slept through all of that <laughs> and then went outside in the middle of the day and there's this exploded bus behind the flat and I'm just like, what is going on out here? And some nice old lady came out of a, a, um, a little tea shop and said, come in and have a hot Ribena. <laughs> I fell in love with London. I was there for that whole month as the attacks kept happening and I just loved it because the Londoners were like, we've been through the blitz. You actually can't scare us with this stuff. So I fell in love with that place. This is July 2005, London. In Regent's, Park's, in Regent's Park Gardens, verticality, spike and explosion, green tangerining, orange, yellow careening, peach to pink, the upward momentum of purple, then stunning black, beauty of burqa, a woman, a walking eclipse. She keeps her secret, a promise, the terrifying allure of her body shaded, her movement an almost silence. She whose past material whispering air, quiet as a peregrine's glide through snowfall, the slicing of a live white through white. I worried for that woman so much, just seeing her like walking around. I was just like, the world is weird and terrible. This is Body Worlds 2, 
ex-lady. Her name moves away from her as if without the body, it could see the monster it is. Over there, hung up like desire, like art on the wall, a black barred peep show called Consent. A form has been filled out, but in whose hand? If the glove does not fit, you must forget that, your own middle names, Nicole. I remember how hard it was to pull myself back in by degrees, quickly like yanking up office blinds, like the sound that makes, accordion, a ripple, like a countdown to blast off, like coming, but this is the violent opposite of that. Gender is monstrous. Her appellation, lady, but who wants to sing this song again? In from where, from where I was almost asleep, floating outside my body, but not even a German pseudoscientist can find the space to which I returned. I turned a corner, and this is what I saw. I guess I should have told the story for those who weren't in the <laughs> in the in the thing today of actually what I saw, which was I mean I saw that gender is monstrous, but it, I saw uh, one of the body world's bodies that was up on in toe shoes, the legs were whole, and then the top half of the body was all split up into sections and the skull was split open in three sections and there, so then there are the eyes and the tongue all and so it just looked like a monster um, and all of the the exhibited bodies before had had placards that were explaining what they were showing about the body and the first one you know would say this plastinet shows because that's how they refer to them because the bodies are all shot through with plastic this plastinet shows this plastinet shows this plastinet shows and then when I saw that that one and looked and it was the first of the female bodies and then the placard said this lady shows and I thought oh yeah okay that yeah that's happening every day in the world uh, I did not write down the page number for this This is a series of poems called Black Body Radiator. Black Body Radiators are um, used to ground the color scale. Um, they're kind of made up, um, made up things like so that we have a zero for the color scale. Um, and so, yeah, there's a series in, um, I'm interested in the ways that we make things up to kind of ground ourselves sometimes in the world and the messed up effects that that has. And so in the third of the poems, there will be a, a, and the way that we like kind of decide as a community to do that kind of move. And so the third of the poems has an epigraph from Wikipedia because I'm also interested in the ways in which we decide like, oh, we're gonna make knowledge as a community together. Anybody can put up here the thing that they think is real and, and it's information and then we'll all just kind of agree that that's a real, real thing. That, that that definition is a real thing too. So, black body radiator. A snake shows me his orange tongue, and I praise him. You, I say, are beautiful. To my husband's absence, the iridescent black dragonflies refusing my proffered finger. Nothing trusts how beautiful I can find almost anything I must be. I cross a field and crickets leap away from me, 50 at a time. Black body radiator. I cross a field and crickets leap away from me, 50 at a time. Not magic, black disarrangement. Minutes before they were music, swell and sudden silence. Green grasshoppers scattering. The ground and I are shedding ourselves toward atmosphere. In the movies, a vampire disintegrates. In a twinkling, he is an obelisk of rats. It, an obelisk of rats collapsing, running for the door. He is 100 bats flying off in every direction. 
His sexiest trick is smoke. He curves up from the door, uh, up from the jam gap to slip be beneath the coverlets of a frightened girl to recompose himself as music swells. A man above her in her bed and something else, Dracula's a name for, our fear of. This facility with which he flies apart pulls her. I approach the smallest of waterfalls for splash the way he cannot be held. Black body radiator. Real objects never behave as full ideal black bodies. The radiance or observed intensity is not a function of direction. The net power is the difference between what someone absorbs from their surroundings and what they radiate themselves. It will never become invisible. Wikipedia. Black body radiator. We are all called something. Labels are mothers affixed to our new black bodies. So when we strayed, at least we'd know to call ourselves June. Lucille, Gwendolyn, Elizabeth, Harriet, Toy, Rita, Nikki, Phyllis? Who's out there calling you? And what is that you're answering to? I'm a little bit obsessed with Phyllis Wheatley and so and, and about the fact that we don't know what that child's name was when she was um, enslaved um, by the Wheatleys. She was a seven-year-old girl who they, uh, a sickly child wrapped in a carpet who they um, bought off of that ship that was called Phyllis. I'm going to do that thing again and read a poem I wish I'd written. <laughs> and this one is by Alvaro Rios. When There Were Ghosts. On the Mexican side in the 1950s and 60s, there were movie houses everywhere, and for the longest time, people could smoke as they pleased in the comfort of the theaters. The smoke rose and the movie told itself on the screen and in the air both. The projection caught a little in the wavering mist of the cigarettes. In this way, every story was two stories and every character lived near its ghost. Looking up, we knew what would happen next before it did, as if, as if it, the movie, were dreaming itself and we were part of it, part of the plot itself and not just the audience. And in that dream, the actors' faces bent a little, hard to make out exactly in the smoke, so that Maria Felix and Pedro Armendariz looked a little like my aunt and one of my uncles. And so they were, and so were we all in the movies which is how I remember it. Popcorn in hand, smoke in the air, gum on the floor. Those Saturday nights, we ourselves were the story and the stuff and the stars. We ourselves were alive in the dance of the dream. Not fair, man. <laughs> That's not cool. <laughs> like, um, yeah. This is lost in that, in the air of, I wanted, I wanted this poem in the air of that poem, lost. The river, unrolled bolt of silk, gives evening the smell of fish, wet leaves, loosening matter. We glide through 
its blue plum tint toward night, the leftover tang of red wine in our mouths. Upstream, an idea waits for us. If we were lost, how much more would we love each other? We four move toward this losing with the steady creak and drip of our rowing. We cannot, in lowering darkness, tell direction, whether the frog's croak came from behind or before us. Our bellies full, the swamp beckons us behind its green drapery. Whatever hides in the tangle, the surprise of cypress knees, the fierce, sharp-edged palms welting our forearms as we walk blind through mottled nights, sulfur rot and sucking mud. What flies into our mouths, impossible to see. Mosquitoes lighting in our ears, their constant whine, high-pitched and crazy-making. The silent patience of gators and our weary estimation of their hunger. We will keep, we are certain, as we lose ourselves for hours, when we find ourselves again bankside and two must choose to swim because we're not where we began. The river moves despite our stillness, our breath breathing itself into the wet heat. Whether they disappear for good, the two who splash away, their heavy kicking swallowed by this evening. I am of the two who wait, waist high in water, eyes stretched wide to see nothing but night washing itself, black over black, in muggy layers, inches from my face. Not my hands, skin of water, curve of meniscus, my breasts where I displace it, my undissolved legs immersed, merged with water, losing above, in, out of, but for these hands sliding over me, another's hands to keep me from becoming current tongue, lisp of leaf tips touching water, but for we too touching, agreeing, this is my body, agreeing, I still belong in it. That poem is based on a crazy night, true story. I'm a native Floridian, my best friend's a native Floridian. She and I cooked dinner one night for my boyfriend at the time and his best friend took our canoe upriver and walked into the swamp after dinner. <laughs> and the sun set while we were in the swamp and we were lost in the swamp for six hours. And it is the closest to dying I've ever come in my whole life. I, by rights, I should be dead, and we should all be um, dead. We thought we were going to die at that point at which we, this, we had to separate because we had to figure out oh, somebody's got to help us. We didn't know where our boat was. We didn't know where anything was. And we thought, yeah, we're going to get eaten by gators, pretty much. The fact that I am not like kind of makes me believe and my, my mom was always saying, you know, that she that she um, the language she would use is I don't know who else in here has been raised Pentecostal or religiously as I, uh, I was, but she would say she pray, she prayed a hedge of protection around us. You ever hear that growing up? My mom used to say she would pray a hedge of protection around us. And man, after that six hours in the swamp, I was like, hedge of protection, man. <laughs> yeah, I am into that. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Oh my gosh. And then here's another threat of coming apart poem. This is R. R. Lyre Matter. He still exists as flesh. It's the idea that's dissipated. Husband, what was he? But a word I loved. There is no panacea for missing syllables. His body, we all know what matter is mostly made of. Space obtains. One day I realized, I believe, the space in everything is God. That force of present absence, pen expanse. 
I grieve old fashioned distance, squinting it into view between body and name. In here, I'm loose as love is, nebulous. What good, this pointillism, our eyes won't do. Sometimes the absences in us seem so profuse. I wonder we don't pass through wood. Now I'm gonna switch over pretty much completely to brand new stuff. <laughs> so you all have to tell me again, kind of what's working in here and what isn't. Um, I'm working on a new collection of poems. It's called The Coal Tar Colors. And um, one of the things that's neat to me that's happening in this as I'm working on this new collection that usually works as a good sign for me is if when I, usually I feel like, okay, I'm driving this work forward, I'm, I'm making these poems. And then with both of the previous collections, suddenly there'll spring up a voice that will be not me, <laughs> that just starts talking like, I got some things to say here. And as I'm writing the coal tar colors, this dragon has showed up. So there's a dragon, her name is Centralia. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Centralia, Pennsylvania and what has been happening in Centralia, Pennsylvania since 1952. It's an old coal mining town. Um, uh, they set a fire at the municipal dump in 1952. The fire got into the mines and has been burning since 1952. And they say that it's gonna burn for another 250 years. Um, at least, and so Centralia has been largely evacuated, but there are people who live there who have just refused to leave, and um, so there's this fire under there that's, that's talking, but Centralia has already told me, she's like, well, you call me Centralia, but that's not my name. I'm like, okay, Centralia, whatever. <laughs> so she constantly has things to say, but this was the first of the things that she had to say and in the book, she just is speaking out of an empty open interval. So it's just, that, those are the titles. It's just an empty open interval. And then her voice is coming out. This poem has an epigraph from a woman named Laura Veers. Anybody know her music? Laura Veers? She's got this great song, Drink Deep. Um, and the epigraph comes from that. The chorus of the song is, Drink Deep, my love, for the water is thirsting for your mouth, which I just love. And the epigraph comes from that song. And the epigraph is, I smell in the charred darkness, a little green, a little red. And then here's Centralia's voice. I got your red. <laughs> Sorry, she cracks me up. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I smell in the charred darkness a little green, a little red. I got your red, carmoisine, ponceau, allura, down here. Color me, color maker, smoldering city smelter, abandoned to my own horrorless empty, grown worn with wearing, wearing. What respite but in refashioning when, when as I widen, when, couture and underthing, as sexy as an underthing is. Witness this first blush, whoa, flame whisper, a catch, tartrazine to come, a sunset yellow flash of tempered anticipate what world just opened up full through gorgeous eurythmic this brilliant blue corona i'm wistful you missed it then again that one girl's lyrics didn't lie water thirst gone and drink each element wants something what is is my hungry, yes, I'm coming for myself. That was the first thing. I was like, okay, who is this? <laughs> What's happening? 
Um, and she said, I'm a dragon. I was like, okay. Now, when I was writing, when I was writing Open Interval, when that started happening, I was just like, hmm, don't say these things to people out loud, Lyra, because <laughs> that's not going to work out for you so well. But now, since it did work out for me really well, I'm like, yeah, there's a dragon talking to me in my head. This next poem is um, Homing. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't know how much to say about it, so I'm not going to say anything. Maybe I'll tell you something about it at the end. Homing. I hear bird song in a banjo riff, the last train to Rajasthan. My frailing friend, a harlequin scar above his eye, tells me how once a bluebird sang, a bluebird sang to warn him before he swung an ax that would retort, slicing his brow. Now he listens to birds. I want to be the head-hung girl who stills a song from the amalgam. Where the notes rise, I want my thumb. Where once Freya was a woman, a basket of figs, a woman was a bird once. Once a woman stood before a southern gate, a bird on her shoulder whispering, frail. This is a fairy tale. She listened to its rhythms too easy to beat, the tar out of a thing too easy to tar, and feather to ride out on. A rail my harlequin scarred friend claw hammers, drones an argument for what a dropped thumb means. He won't take a cent for teaching me. He says, I want you to know everything I know, meaning he means to distill what I know. He used to live in Virginia. So did I. In Lexington. Imagine sweet things. Air thick with the scent of sugar cone. The colonnade black crepe swirled like licorice dick candy in the portrait of Lee's funeral on the ice cream parlor wall. Boys beautiful as follow wills chirped serenades in Confederate gray to blondes they hoped to escort to the Old South Ball in 1991. Since 1878, some birds warbled sweet in the springtime thicket of a song stuck in the throat of a state. The dismal swamps a trap for academics the song, satiric or ecstatic, a bad rap for bland, sharpy dark and permanent. That thing memory just misses, messes, an excuse to sing darkly. Carried back, Virginia's a stranger's bare-chested, bird-chested child, reared back akimbo as for flight into a jagger chick strut. That last image is stolen from Sally Mann. I don't know if anybody who knows that Sally Mann's photography in here. Her, it can be like kind of really super controversial. People have strong opinions about it. I love her work so much. Um, and she got into real like kind of uh, controversy. Um, she was taking pictures of her children as they grew up. And um, um, she lives in the town where I used to live and go to school and her children, um, um, Jesse in Virginia and Owen. Um, I knew two of the children. I was a baker in that town, and they would just come in and take chocolate, and you know, like they were these like kind of wild kids. And there's that picture of Virginia on the front of immediate family with her chest out like that. And so I don't know if that poem is finished. You all can tell me. Um, I'm gonna pop back to to open interval for just a second and read um, a poem called Dear John Invention. There are a lot of Dear John letters in open interval and part of the, um, the, the identity of the John who um, they're talking to is a, an 18th century astronomer named John Goodrick 
who um, studied the stars, particularly pulsating uh, variable stars uh, called Lyrae <laughs> stars. And um, so this is one of the letters that kind of is in conversation with him and his work. Dear John, Invention. There in Groningen, the body you wait for me to give you. And your mother, as I imagine her, dealing with your fever, her faith. The university, a heaven of sorts, beyond you, glittering. Out the window, the voice you release, crying. Here, Mick Jagger sings wild horses. There, Banneker carves his wooden clock writes his note to Jefferson. There, there, Lavina croons, soothing you, silent. The difference between sound and silence, this lying distance. I'm just gonna read two more. Um, this one, Scarlet RR, I just thought it was so weird when I started this project because the RR designation and the way that they um, name stars like kind of runs through open interval. And then I started looking at the coal tar colors and it's like this reverse thing when they're making the coal, coal tar colors, the designations run so that sometimes there's an RR after the colors. And I thought, okay, that's odd. Um, so Scarlet RR is a coal tar color. Um, I guess I'll, that's all I'll say about that. Scarlet RR, take the shine off. Grief's mandate. Black crepe. No mirrors. The gate blows open as though a ghost out there. Saracen, a veil. Morning's gum. Breathe through it. Substance, sticky in the mouth. A tint inclined towards red, an intermediate scarlet, petticoats trimmed with do not dance. This is not your white picket fence, your banjo lesson renaissance, all claw hammer and veins of coal up north, your uncolored post. Another science, dying, the making of mourning clothes. And then this last poem that I'm going to read is um, about traveler. So I got my undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University. Any W now people? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Uh, Washington and Lee's in Lexington, Virginia, and it's, of course, named for George Washington and Robert E. Lee. Um, Robert E. Lee is buried on campus. Mm -hmm. So is his horse, Traveler. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Traveler um, used to not be buried. Traveler used to be stuffed. Yeah, I guess, and then, I, or maybe it was a skeleton. I, I'll never get this story right, but I like the notion of it being stuff. Anyway, anyways, Traveler, after a while, he got a little undignified, and the Daughters of the American Revolution decided that, nope, 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 we can't have that, and so they buried proper travel, uh, travel traveler properly um, in a grave next to Lee Chapel, um, where Robert E. Lee, who when we were going to school, we called Dead Bob, was buried. <laughs> there's a recumbent Lee. There's the recumbent Lee in the in the chapel, and so you could just like be in there and see Dead Bob. And so like when I was going there, it was like kind of really really crazy time. And as if it wasn't conservative enough, it had just gone co-ed. They had just graduated their first class of women, and it was like so super conservative. And and there's a gate. Um, in front of that sculpture of the recumbent Lee. And if they thought, like, that they didn't approve of you, you'd get the visual of the gate, gate would be closed. And so there would be dead Bob behind the gate. Like, and so, like, Lonnie Guineer came to campus, and it was just like, ugh. Oh. And it was the gate, and Robert E. Lee is back there. But anyway, Traveler, the horse, is buried outside, and people leave gifts for him. They leave pennies and apples and little Confederate flags for travel, Traveler on his grave site. And the garage of the president's house 
used to be Traveler's stable. And the garage doors of the president's house are always left open in case Traveler Spirit decides to cross campus and go home at night. Yeah. So this poem is called Another Truce. Another Truce. Now the horse is memory, an idea of movement buried behind the chapel, down the hill, from the white colonnades, red brick. Three states, 150 years away. Still, to resent this one dead creature, how might I have felt to encounter its gray coat, to stroke its mane were time not just impossible with history's brutalities. The stable doors wide open fill my closet with January's cold as though Virginia were behind this door I close to sleep at night. The horse, dust in the corners, what the room makes of my skin of night. If I brush nightmare from memory, I am left with something breathing, a gesture of care, firm bristles. The scent of hay and apples, of ice, sweetens my bedclothes. I am in a dream of traveler without weaponry. No musket fire spooks or spurs his steady pulling. I have erased the general in heather and purple. Spring is in winter as I am in this dream that is my life, where what I teach myself I keep. The horse jigs past his own gravesite, heedless of stars and bars staked as though to hold it. Some mealy mouth old half magic we do not rest there, but land where I learn and love I have taught myself to ride, waking to my own gifts, to the sun's glint on green glass jars of status on my windowsill. Thank you.